Chapter 3 Departure The next morning came soon. San tightened Thunderclap's harness buckles as he waited for Term to appear, looking over to the stable doors every few minutes. Don't fret. It's not even dawn yet. He'll be here shortly, rumbled Thunderclap. San looked up at the blue and frowned as he realized he was being observed. You expect so? If I were him, I'd be getting myself some sleep. He shuffled around to Thunderclap's thick neck, looking into his eyes. But that's just me, I suppose. Probably the only reason I was ever on time at the academy was because Turim came knocking on my door each morning. The copper dragon, Lasertooth, cleared his throat. <clears> throat> the commander is a creature of both habit and integrity. He'll probably stay in his armor the whole time, muttered Sand. He'll be here soon. You can count on that. The dragons were right, of course. It wasn't more than a few moments later when Term's splinter of a shadow appeared in the doorway of the tall stable doors. Morning, Lieutenant, echoed Term's voice from the end of their row. You're well rested, I trust. He was dressed in full armor, blue and glinting like a sapphire. Around his shoulders draped his royal blue cloak. I am, replied Sand. But are you? Why are you up with the fowl? I'm eager to get to East. He adjusted his sword in its scabbard. See? Terrible liar. <laughs> Sand chuckled. He knew full well that his friend didn't want to leave. He barely dragged himself away when he was going home to see his mum. Turm threw a shrewd glance back and tossed his thick leather pack up into his riding shield. Sand made his way around the stall into the open row, signaling for Lasertooth to follow. Ah, <sighs> let's go. The copper followed him toward the gate leading to the takeoff and landing field outside as Turim and Thunderclap came up alongside them. How about you, old friend? said Turim to Thunderclap. How'd you sleep? Not so well, replied the blue dragon. I had a strange dream. About what? I dreamt I'd fallen into a white cave, said Thunderclap. It was cold. Maybe it was ice or winter, I'm not sure. I couldn't see much. The cave was dark as starless midnight. Nevertheless, I walked on for a long time, hoping I'd come to some end that never came. When I was tired, I stopped and sat down. Then I spied a small passage that broke off from the tunnel. Inside it, I saw a bright light. Do you know what was there? Turim exchanged looks with San, then turned a glance at the dragon over his shoulder. Perhaps some sharp rocks or a swarm of goblins. An egg, grunted Thunderclap. An egg of my species. It was strange. I've never seen one of my kind, though I know for certain what I saw was a dragon's egg. Sometimes I've wondered what I was thinking when I rescued you from the mountains. Durham smiled again. Apparently he was in a good mood. It was wisdom. Thunderclap snorted, shaking his head. And don't take my words lightly. I only joke. I'm sure your dream had some deep and profound meaning. Then again, maybe not. That's the nature of dreams. It's usually too late to appreciate that a dream holds any meaning until the events that make sense of it have passed. Ah, you're probably right, grumbled Thunderclap. Nonetheless, the dream has remained in my mind. So I'll remember it for a later time. Maybe it was even a thing that happened to me long ago. An ancient memory, as other dragons have. You're not that old, replied Turim. San chuckled at the pair's banter. Turim had found the dragon in the Dindron Mountains a few years earlier and nursed him back to health. The god knew why. In general, Chromabacks were considered a dangerous breed, filled with greed and hate. Thunderclap tilted his head, and he seemed to be thinking about it all quietly. Then the two men and dragons walked out into the takeoff and landing field. They came to a halt near the center of the green turf, smelling the fresh morning air. The dragon stables had separate cells of stalls for each dragon wing, and each cell had their own departure sites. The field itself consisted of wooden and stone fences encircling a large area of well-worn grass. 
There, dragons stood while their riders prepared themselves for takeoff. Grasping the edge of Laser Tooth's shoulder plate, San pulled himself up to the riding shield. Swinging his leg over, he sank into the saddle and prepared for departure, buckling in. Are you ready? He hollered to Tarim. Tarim gave a brief shake of his helm and fastened the last buckle. Let's get this over with. Thunderclap, we make for East. At his word, the stable boy waved the green pennant. Far across from their field stood a great tower where another squire looked skyward for signs of incoming wings. The squire turned in all directions, then finally waved his own green flag. That signal meant that they were clear to lift into the sky. The pair of dragons beat their great wings one mighty flap to put themselves aloft before they lifted into the dim morning. With several more powerful strokes, they were on their way eastward, off to the ever-verdant island of ease. Grand General Panthus Obsidian Fist rose from his seat, his black armor shining with each flickering of the lantern light. He smiled beneath his winged helm before removing it, setting it on the chair beside him. With a sudden jab, he struck out, catching the captain standing before him squarely in the face. Who gave you the order to make such a short-sighted move, Captain Mershelter? The captain bent over, putting his hand to his nose. The general paced back and forth, his dark cloak wafting behind, his heavy black boots tromping on the moist earth. He could see the fear in the diminutive captain's eyes. It was pitiable. How did this man make rank at all? He wondered to himself. Captain Mearshelter moaned. I apologize, sir. I sent the wing out to find exactly where Granolot Keep was located. I'm sure you'll agree that's useful information. I don't know why the wing didn't return. I have suspicions, true. And I'm sure you're well aware of their nature. Grand General Obsidian Fist stared down at the captain. He was shorter by at least two heads. If you knew anything, you'd know what channels we take to acquire such knowledge. Excuse me, sir? I don't understand, said Captain Mare Shelter, still assessing his nose. His small gloved hands were streaked with red. The general sneered. No, you clearly don't. Your obtuseness is an unfortunate thing. You could have jeopardized everything, fool. Now get out, and I urge you to keep from my sight for the rest of the evening, or you'll end up like that other friend of yours. Yes, sir, returned Captain Mearshelter, a puzzled and frightened look still drawn across his dirty face. I appreciate you've left my ears intact, sir. With the haste of the wind, the captain saluted, spun, then left through the tent flap. General Obsidian Fist waited briefly before going out as well, taking a breath. The rotting aroma of decaying plant life and fungus in the camp had grown almost pleasant to him. Almost. They wouldn't linger there much longer. He'd come to retrieve Captain Mearshelter's men and the other companies after he'd learned of their actions. He spit, angry again. This sort of initiative is what destroyed structure and proper order. Still, by some chance, the captain's maneuver may have proved beneficial, he thought. They could only wait and see what the Genovans would do. He allowed himself a grim <laughs> chuckle. They'd soon be marching back to where many of his knights had left their swamp wyverns, deeper in the fallow marshes. The wyverns were noisy, screeching creatures with feathered wings and serpentine bodies. He hadn't wanted them to give away their position. There was no point to risk unraveling the Black Division's accomplishments they'd made since the overrun of Darapil. He tramped away from the company of dark knights and goblins gathered together outside to eat their evening meal. They too were a loud bunch, but the way they swelled an army's ranks, he appreciated the tool that they were. Gerwemark Rotbone had let him go with a few wings of wyvern riders, some heavy cavalry, and a single squad of goblins. He had strict orders to remain as shrouded as possible, just as those fools under Captain Mare Shelter were supposed to have done. Aside from the wyverns, he had already sent several squads away from the main company to dull the noise. Keeping them all hidden had nearly driven him mad, though no more than staying idle around the tower. The time would come soon, though, 
and those who would take their chances like Captain Mare Shelter and made noise like the Swamp Wyverns would be put in their place and the waiting would be over. He stood watching the marsh before he returned to his tent for the night. Day was approaching. When the remaining squads returned from their positions, he'd give the order and they'd all begin their march through the muck, heading home to the Black Spire. Even from such heights, Term could smell the salty sea breeze of the Garathian Ocean. Far below, its waves crested in foam upon a shimmering blue slate. After passing the coast of Peabok Din several minutes before, the great sheet of deep indigo was all there was to see for miles, save for the large, white aquagulls flying in the opposite direction, undoubtedly heading for shore. The clouds whipped around Term for a moment, shrouding him in sand and sweet, chilled mist. He looked northward and then back to the west, barely able to catch glimpses of the Dindaron's peaks through the clouds. Still no sign of enemy or predator. Comforting. The festival of snows will be dull without you there, continued Sand after they'd come into the clear again. I'd like some leave to go myself, but with the reports coming in from the other keeps regarding the Dragon Army's new draft, the Grand Master probably won't grant us lesser nights any time away, will he? He seemed to be trying to appear as though he cared less than he obviously did. It's a dispirited thing to say, said Durham. But I'm afraid he probably won't. He can't. The Council of Races won't allow it, not with war so close. That only makes me wonder why they mandate leave for anyone at all, though. His face went sour again. Still, it's not Daynard's fault in any case. The Council doesn't make their laws without merit, interrupted Lasertooth. And it's not done without the backing of their people either. But to have the officers away is foolish, said Sand, engaging his mount. It's dangerous. Turim agreed wholeheartedly, but made no sign. The council cannot see what danger it'll bring, said Lasertooth. But they can see the toll upon those such as yourself, Commander Gliderlands. Don't you see how worn you've become these past months? It's plain to us all. And it's not only you. Many of our officers seem to weaken in mind, and surely in body, under the weight of exhaustion. I believe the Council speaks wisely in the matter. You must look at it with a much broader eye. Turim regarded Lasertooth's words. He was the wisest of the dragons in Turim's wing. Only a handful of dragons that dwelt with the Knights of the Hawk were older and had better memory. The other dragons in the wing admired Lasertooth for his wisdom and kind counsel. Even Thunderclap, who definitely held some disdain for many of the shining scale dragons, showed Lasertooth proper respect, most of the time. Thunderclap cocked his head to the side. Turm wondered what he might say, but he remained silent, seeming to hold his tongue. Turm paused a moment, uncertain if he should continue. The notion had been teetering at the edge of his mind since the previous night. I also wonder where the Black Division is massing. We've seen a few scattered wings, but there's been no reports of their whereabouts since their desertion of Darapel. <laughs> nice way to spoil good conversation, Turum, complained Sand. He immediately changed the subject. I'm getting on towards hungry about now. How about you? The dragons would be fine with the snack they'd taken that morning. They could hold a meal for days if need be, but sand was another story. Turim agreed and they pulled sacks of jerked pollo from their bags, snacking as they flew. It was the pale meat of the fowl, but made into jerky it had been heavily salted and spiced to keep it good for a long time. Turim kept both eyes open while he ate, wary of potential dangers as they traveled further eastward. But there was nothing save distant clouds and waves and the fresh, open air of the world. Well past midday, after talking and laughing almost as though they were kids again, a small speck appeared on the sea. Shortly, the speck grew into a green isle, like a mint gumdrop floating atop the waves. At the slow setting of the sun, colors of fall reflected up from the Garathian as they glided lower toward the island called Ease. Yves was covered entirely in dense forest, save for the Yavri Mountains that ran along its eastern coast, 
jagged and titanically tall. These peaks slipped slowly towards sea level on the western side. Mist hung around their green tops, running down through the cracks and crags, and Turin remembered what the Grandmaster had said about their constant lingering. We're nearly there, Sam called, gesturing down. It looks like the fishing's good. The coast of the island wasn't far below now. Across the sandy beach, Turin could see a few lone fishermen scattered, while others sat in small boats anchored just offshore, listing from side to side in the waves. Are you checking the map? Asked Turim, his thoughts still on his destination. Sand's eyes peered down at a carven map he held. Paper was far too difficult to manage at such speeds, so dragon riders used wooden ones. Where exactly is dwelling? Wait, there, is that it? Called Turim. His eyes fell across a large wooden cabin in a grassy hollow amidst the trees. Sand nodded as he tapped the wood with his armor-clad finger. Yeah, he said. That's it. Circling slowly, the dragons came to rest in an open area outside the cabin. The grass there wasn't as green as the trees, and it came to the shoulder of a small hare. Turm watched as the hare scurried off, only to survey them from a distance at the edge of the wood. He slowly stood, then jumped down from the shoulder plate of his blue dragon. With his arms behind his back, he stretched within the limitations of his armor. Riding over long distances could be cramping. Stay on for lunch? He asked San and the dragon, still unwilling to see them go. I can sit, but just for a bit. We're going to probably miss supper as it is. Tough to judge, though. San's gaze went skyward, then back towards the cabin as though he could see how far they'd come. This is a way out from our usual range. Then the lieutenant gathered himself and clanked down from Lasertooth's riding shield to the ground. Turm took a last look over the dragons and gave a salute to Thunderclap and Lasertooth as he and San approached the door. For an instant, he saw the subtle shake of trees as wildlife moved off away from the clearing, birds or dragonflies by the sound of it, then turned with the key he'd been given and entered.